Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. Grammarly is a free AI-powered writing tool that assists you from start to finish. Get help brainstorming ideas for your paper and more. Go to grammarly.com slash students to download for free. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash students. The United States Border Patrol has exciting and rewarding career opportunities with the nation's largest law enforcement organization. Earn great pay, outstanding federal benefits, and up to $20,000 in recruitment incentives. Learn more online at cbp.gov slash career slash USBP. This is Black Menopause and Beyond. You are listening to the podcast episode called Allyship in the Menopause Space and it's part two. So a few days ago I released part one and now this is part two. There is a third part to the interviews with Lucinda and then I've also interviewed another person and that would be the fourth part. So please enjoy the podcast. Wanting to know more from my perspective about diversity, differences and cultures is only part of my journey to being able to help more people more effectively. But finding ways to learn more is tricky. Yeah. Partly it's, it's fear of asking the wrong questions. Partly it's um, fear of revealing my ignorance and causing offence that I didn't mean to cause. So asking the wrong question the wrong way, which we've sort of touched on, but how to find out more. So what advice can you give me on how to get it right? How to... Because some of the questions are quite sensitive and they are colour colour and culture related. It's they just really, are. Yeah. Because I can't learn about a different culture or somebody from a different colour skin to me without asking direct questions. It's so... I mean, I agree with you. It's hard. It is hard. I mean, all I can do is I can give you my understanding around it and some of the issues and barriers from my perspective as a person of colour. So for me, because it's my lived experience... I don't necessarily want to be part of someone's research campaign, if that makes sense. So because I do stuff around menopause, I very often get emails from researchers who want to find out about or who want to do surveys and stuff. And they want greater ethnic minority participation. And I used to do loads of them. And I still do volunteer my time and whatever, but I'm way more selective now. Um, and these are different reasons why. One, they're being paid to take their time. To research i'm not one of the issues about being a diverse woman is that you are economically poorer i mean i'm a single parent i i have to raise i've got a child in university i work my only income from my house is what i do the more time i volunteer in providing people who are paid to get information from me but i'm not being paid for that time economically is 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 ineffective with regards to my household if that makes sense i can't spend 20 hours a week volunteering my time to people who earn a lot of money out of my research <laughs> so that's one thing two you never hear an outcome i'm in my workspace or organizations that i've helped out with research very often you do research, they, there's a report produced and nothing is done with it. They feel that all they had to do is do the research. And therefore it was an ineffective use of my time if no change has come about. And so people like me don't necessarily participate sometimes in research because not only is it a waste of time, their physical time, it can be detrimental to their household because, you know, that you're spending time filling the survey instead of sitting, helping your child do homework. You know, you know, it's detrimental. But then the researchers um, don't understand the information or don't implement anything they've learned. Or they've, well, if they don't understand it, then it could be that their recommendations are, are irrelevant and you don't get feedback. You don't have a chance to see the results. So it could be they didn't understand you and their recommendations will have no impact. So what I'm saying, it is hard for you based on what my experience it, it, my experience of research at my end. What's the best way? I really don't know. I personally think it's about interacting more so on a social level. But at the end of the day, if this is part of your professional job, that's not practical, I presume. 
research um, around ethnic minorities and diversities and what they call harder to reach communities is complicated because of what I've just said. And we just, we're not guinea pigs. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to, so I, I, even though I want allies to understand my narrative, after you've done a few elements of research and you see how it's run, you feel like a guinea pig or you feel like you're being used or you feel like your a box is being ticked. And therefore that contributes to that lack of willingness to help you research. If you've ever encountered people who don't want to help you, that's part of the contrib- that's partly why they feel I'm not a guinea pig. Or um why am I taking an hour to help you and then you economically can benefit from my information when I've actually got the housework to do or I've got to sit down with my child and do homework with them. So I, I really don't know what to, <laughs> I really don't know what to say because it is so complicated. And I know from my perspective, loads of women complain about how we're just used as guinea pigs for research, but by other people or we're tokenized, um, but actually we're not valued. Um, and, and also I work in the community sector, I know about funding. So I know at the end of the day, if you put it on a project and the project you account for all the key elements with regards to economics. So on the project, you you, pack, you cover staff. If you need to create a, um, uh, a display space, if it's an art project, say for instance, you allocate funding for a painter and decorator to decorate the room, blah, 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 blah. But then the project needs the cultural input. And then for some reason, most research organizations that seek funding to do their research, don't pay the source of the information that the whole project is based on. And even though I know it does have an impact, they think, because I think there's a logic that if you pay them, it will influence the outcomes. But at the same time, if you understand you're working with disadvantaged communities, um, then you you're, you potentially can be contributing to the disadvantage because you're using their time. So I, I, I know it might not be very helpful, <laughs> But that's, that's sometimes a what big answer. That's a really big answer. <laughs> but, but the, um, yeah. it, that's why it's so hard for you to do research. So for me, yes. I as part of what I do. I mean, the reason why we we've spent loads of times talk, talking because I can see that you're really passionate about this topic, and I and you've listened to all my podcasts. You've listened to loads of other people's podcasts. So for me, I will always give you as much time as you need because I can see your passion to make a change and to understand and make a difference. However, sometimes you come across people and you know it's literally box ticking, their boss has given them a job, it's part of a funded research and they really don't care about the quality of my life. Um, And therefore I don't invest my time in in that research. That's yeah. It's again hearing your perspective on that is is fascinating because quite often when I'm talking menopause statistics, for example, um, the research is skewed to white women in England, you know, part time workers, if working at all, going to yoga classes and making everything happy, which is a um, starting point, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of you know sort of say, well, what about the rate, the, the the cultural differences around these statistics around the age of menopause for example or the type of symptoms experienced through menopause and there isn't enough research to give solid answers over what type of person will be affected by what type of symptom and what is the long-term health negativity or benefit of that and there isn't the research to back up statistics on there because the surveys haven't been done yet because if people leading those surveys are are white women they're more likely to collect information around that space but when there are surveys out there to be answered or trying to collect research from people from different backgrounds, the fact that there isn't a big take up on providing that information, you've just explained it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's you know, need all that information, but don't know where to get it. And I'm not a medic and I'm not doing a great big PhD or, or mm. you know, writing, rewriting the health policy. So starting at a really minor end, I can listen to podcasts and learn from those, or I can bring you and ask you questions um, and speak to people but that doesn't give me statistics to give sound advice on, you know, 
But turn around to say the average age of menopause in the UK is 51. And that's true. The average age of menopause in the UK or reaching menopause is 51. But it will be slightly different depending on, on your cultural heritage. You are more likely to reach menopause a little bit younger if you are of African or Caribbean origin. And the types of symptoms that you are more likely to be affected by are slightly different for slightly different lengths of time. And that needs to be acknowledged in every talk, but there's yes. not enough research to give specifics. Yeah, I, I don't know how to, I really don't know how to address it because I I have promoted some bits of research and it, no one's been interested. They're just not interested because they don't feel the research is authentic and they really resent being treated as guinea pigs. <laughs> there's a result but at the same time the research needs to be done i think you said earlier the invisible guinea pig something you raised in a, in a podcast really early on one of the ones i listened to um the fact that you need different levels of vitamin d depending yeah. on skin color yeah and that that's not on the side of a bottle yeah and it would never have crossed my mind that you know all different types of sun cream yeah and that Anything. as we get older yeah we need higher spf factors regardless of skin color but it needs to be different, or, or the ingredients in sun cream need to be slightly different depending on your skin colour. I don't know what I don't know what that's got to do with menopause, but it has because we're getting older and we need more sun cream. So yeah, but the, yeah. the reason what what it has to do with is the fact that actually because you're because I'm never the default, conversations around my health are never one hundred percent applicable. So I never I didn't know that the majority of people of colour, especially people of my shade of of black probably there's a high chance during, especially during winter have vitamin d deficiency a high proportion which affects your immunity you know little things like that little dialogues like, like that can affect and i know some people say oh i knew that i was thinking well i didn't and i'm i'm nosy and there's loads of people who aren't who don't research information who don't do anything if they don't know every winter they're taking more time off work they're more miserable because they're going through a vitamin D deficiency when they could have addressed that by getting out the car one, you know, a b- bit more often and walking to places or um, taking higher dosage, not the dose dose me- recommended on the side of the box, a higher dose for their skin colour. Um, and, and, and that to me is like really basic and no one's never, I don't see it publicly t- spoken about at all. Um, and I've been to doctors loads of time. Doctors never mentioned it to me. Um, the doctor, very often, because I'm a larger woman, I'm a plus size woman. The doctor's always telling me to lose weight. He's never told me. He's never said, "Oh, I, how's your vitamin D levels? You know, um, are you feeling sluggish? Are you feeling tired?" I said, "Yeah." Well, you know, top up your vitamin D. Doctors never said that to me. But when when GPs, I don't know, when GPs in England are doing their medical training. Uh, they've only just managed to put menopause on the on the uh, compulsory agenda starting mm. next year. So so that, you know, that's a step in the right direction around menopause. Do you know if there's any cultural, what, what's the wonderful comment you had? Um, cultural, I've written it down, can't find it. Um, intelligence training in GP training at all, if you're trained in the UK. I, are, I don't are humans know. Or humans, and then there's a subsection women. I mean, I'm, and they, I'm, they haven't got as far as diversity. They haven't got di- yeah no I'm not aware of that I, I think they're becoming more conscious of it I think when as part yeah. of their doctors training um, when they're doing things around say for instance skill, skin complaints and things like that they incorporate images which um, you know rashes on black skin look different than rashes on white skin yeah and things like that and I know recently I went to the doctor. It wasn't recent. It was beginning of the year. I went to a doctor because I this mark grew on my foot. This big mark grew on my foot, and it looked like skin cancer. Yeah, it it looked like skin cancer, and the doctor said to me, and it clearly had been trained. He said that looks like a form of skin cancer that only appears on black and brown skin, and it only appears on the palms of your hands and on the soles of your feet. It doesn't appear anywhere else. Now, it turns out it wasn't skin cancer. But if you put skin cancer in the Google search engine, that would obvious reason just wouldn't well not obvious reason it just wouldn't appear. And also the language around skin cancer says you know, it mentions blue eyes and pale skin, 
when I'm neither, but actually this form skin cancer, which relates to people of color, it doesn't, it doesn't do a kind of a side note. However, there are skin cancers which affect different ethnicity groups and they look different. And, and, you know, it doesn't mention that at all. So for a person like me, um, when I saw this mark, which at the end, it was the size of a two P piece. Yeah. Appear on my foot. Yeah. Um, and it was jet black. Yeah. Um, and it came from nowhere. Um, when I saw that and I put in skin cancer before I went to the doctor, what appeared looked nothing like what I had. So my doctor clearly was trained because he told me it related to um, it it skin cancer, it related to, let's say, for, uh, it, it relates to Africa and my, and my ancestry in Africa. And he also told me that's the same skin cancer that Bob Marley had. Yeah, and he's a white doctor. So he was clearly trained um, yeah. on the topic. So there must be something going there. I, but I don't know in general what they're, what they're talking about. <laughs> my thoughts are they're probably not yet as a general training is mm. cultural comp that's where cultural competence mm. um, and cultural sensitivity brought into general training yeah at all which is it just it just widens that gap that we're all trying to close around any particular health care issue but you know around menopause as well so you know different reactions to different vitamin levels needed at this stage of life mm. um and the different type of uh long-term the long-term impact of having less hormones is different depending on your um, ethnicity you know more likely to be osteo struggle with osteoporosis if you are a woman of, of African origin for example or Southeast Asian than if you're a white woman but there's not enough research around that to really sort of stand up what could be done about it long term what needs to be done what do we need to be looking out for as we approach midlife depending on who we are will very much depend on cultural diversity ethnicity home background but also our financial situation how how well we eat what we eat mm. how often we eat um the types of food that we eat the time of day that we eat all of that comes into long-term health care around menopause and beyond i can't remember why i started that third sentence now i just forgot what i was saying but it's okay to be a brain fog when you're menopausal so that's fine <laughs> but yeah i mean also, but, yeah. i mean also one of the obstacles i found as well was that when we talk about food and menopause culturally the general conversation is around a mediterranean diet but certain communities if you're 50 you're not ever eating the Mediterranean diet. You're just not going to change. I'll be realistic. So sometimes the conversation, which is not necessarily the GP space, it's the general space, needs to be more culturally understanding. So foods within that culture, what's good for menopause and what's bad for menopause? I know I, I had a conversation once with somebody and I'm, and I'm not a health expert at all. I'm just really a community work to strike activist. So all this is a learning process for me. And I was talking to someone who used to be actually a nurse. Um, and she said to me that since her menopause, she makes more effort to eat yam because yam is also part of her cultural diet. And I said, but one of the sensitivities you develop as part of menopause is diabetes. And doesn't yam have a high sugar content? So even though yam, for some reason, is, is sometimes connected to HRT, which I don't quite understand, yeah, is what she's doing is it more detrimental to her health than positive and she went and thought oh yeah because i'm increasing the chance of diabetes when the chance of diabetes is already high and uh, whatever yam does with regards to like hormone replacement is it a high enough dosage to actually make a difference and i and i thought it probably isn't because mainstream doctors don't say eat yam instead of hrt <laughs> No, but you just touched on something massive there, because one of the things that um, obviously the, the people can do around menopause, everybody can do, is learn to eat for the body we've got now and the life we want to have for the next 30 years to counterbalance those symptoms. And I have not yet come across anything culturally relevant around eating a better diet or different times of day that reflects different cultures yet. I'm sure yeah. it's out there. I hope it's out. There. I'm going to go and find it because I need to know that. But that's absolutely back to the question of of where can I learn from others learning about the just saying eat a better eat a healthier diet really does get affected by what we eat to start with mm. which of course can be culturally influenced as well you know yeah. eating curry late at night with white carbs white starchy carbs will probably impact somebody's sleep now that's fine if you're not from a if you don't naturally eat curry if you're not a curry yeah. eater yeah. you know and and even if you are going to eat curry it's once a week on a friday night when you're going to sleep in on saturday yeah. that's a really different bit of advice from one person than it is to another whose natural diet might be much spicier yeah. might naturally eat later in the day because of that their 
get home from work at eight o'clock. So yeah, I need to go and find, yes, eating more sensibly, but that needs to be culturally sensitive. To, yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah, also understanding so. that some cultural foods are high carbohydrate driven. Yeah. So yeah. it's about having that conversation on how you can still have that cultural food and alter the carbohydrates. So it could be that they have to reduce their carbohydrates relationship in their diet, but it's still their traditional food. It could be just reducing. So that, that nurse who increased her uh, yam intake, and I was thinking, the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert. It's like, you know, I, I have a weight problem. I struggle to lose weight. I don't really know the answers, but surely increasing your carbohydrates, which has, the yam has a high sugar content, is the last thing you should be doing as part of your menopause diet, not the first thing to do. And I could be wrong. I mean, I could be wrong. She's, yeah, but yam's very good for menopause. And I was thinking, but it's not good for diabetes and it's not, you know, it's not good in other areas. It's a bit like saying, well, it's very similar. Exercise is really good for us all, unless the exercise you're doing is putting so much pressure on your hips that yeah. it breaks. Them. Yeah. So, it, yeah, you know, it, it's that what is right for that individual at what time of day as well, and what time of day really does does yeah. matter. You know, yams for breakfast is very different for yams at ten o'clock at night yeah. because of the carbohydrate content. But but knowing the different layers in there mm. is a whole, whole. We've just opened up a whole new whole yeah. new chapter on how to eat culturally to benefit your body around your menopause not yeah. just you know and also that's also one of the areas of disengagement because when you seek menopause care especially from non-medical spaces they very often talk about foods you should eat and because there's a lack of cultural representation that person feels that that group or that organization doesn't understand their journey with menopause and that will increase their disengagement with them it's the same also with black black hair as well when you talk about hair and stuff like that they don't they don't include within that conversation of of how to manage your hair during menopause products which are good for black hair um and yeah, and yeah so so i know loads of people they don't mind being in white menopause spaces yeah they don't mind being in any spaces they're culturally integrated but they're conscious that sometimes conversations just don't talk about them okay, and therefore so they have to seek yeah i want a question right off the back of that a spontaneous one it might sound really uh, wrong but i need to be able to ask it if i am giving a menopause talk to say a group of 10 women mm. and one woman in that room i'm gonna say is of uh, caribbean origin so darker skin one woman alone in that room if I'm giving a menopause talk and I am talking generally about menopause, but then bring in a cultural element, for example, so so maybe to talk about hair, let's take that one. Hair thins as we get older, as our estrogen levels go down, our hair will thin, it might go much more, much more frizzy, it might recede, it might go sort of thin around the, the parting. That's general for everybody, but what we do about it will depend on the type of hair we have to start with. So if in that talk, I then bring in, if you've got, you know, uh, if you're white skinned, you've got this sort of hair problem. If you've got any other skin colour, you might have this problem. With am I then coming across as pointedly making a comment to that one woman in the room or am I still being general? That's the sort of fear that I have. I personally, this is my personal view, that to be more inclusive, inclusive is better. But at the same time, it's time's efficiency. So I'm, if I was the only person in that room, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to commit, say, 10% of your conversation talking about um, my narrative, if it's not applicable to the other nine people. But if highlighting the fact that um, if you're from a different ethnic minority group, if afterwards you want to come and have a two minute chat with me, I can signpost you or I can have a, just a brief conversation, the information I've got, or say to the group that if you, if there are cultural differences, the outcomes might be different. Um, um, and just gave, give maybe one minute explanation of that. So I'm, I'm conscious of the fact there's no point in giving you know, 15 or 20 minutes to diverseness when the group is not diverse. Yeah. But one of the but... reasons for doing it is so that any of those nine women might have friends to whom that information is relevant and might pass it on. I think you should mention it. I, I mean, I know sometimes, because I sometimes have to do delivery, I have to tailor it for the needs of the group. So if I have to cram in 
100 hours worth of information into an hour i know realistically loads of things would be cut out but i think if you actually either can give an individual person mention the fact that also this is general information but but if you come from different diverse communities this has a different impact um you know things are different if you want to talk to me afterwards i can signpost you so it could be you're not an expert on it i mean i know i've been in this situation where somebody asked me i don't i i don't proclaim to know loads of stuff i'm google menopause knowledgeable yeah that's what i call it yeah um because i i signpost to professionals that's what i do uh, with regards to my job and i don't and i don't claim to be medical at all i wouldn't i wouldn't come to me for medicine so i wouldn't expect anyone else to <laughs> but one thing i am good at doing is signposting and i say to people you know if you want to come to me if i don't know where to signpost you to i'll find out um in, and whatever so somebody's asked me questions around hrt and the trans community and, and menopause and i'll be honest with you i want to learn i'm finding it's hard to understand menopause and trans conversations i don't and i've got nowhere to go <laughs> you know so i'm in, i'm in a similar boat to you with regards to i know it's something that is very different but i know it's something which is applicable um and i just not quite sure and also i'm have to be quite sensitive because of the transphobia that's out there i'm i have to be very sensitive sensitive to not treating them like guinea pigs not being insensitive to who they are on authenticity and everything um but I definitely think it's important to mention that different communities, diverse communities from different ethnic minority groups, and also mention that the trans relationship with menopause is also very different or the LGBTQ space, it's different. Um, and I can signpost you to it later. Or if, if you have any questions, I can maybe answer it here and now and then move on because you, you, if you, you, can't, you can't answer everything in one hour or two hours. It's such a big topic. Okay, so a question along the same lines. Um, when talking about uh, exercise, for example, the importance of exercise as we get older, both to combat symptoms, menopause symptoms in the short term, but also for our long term health. Um, one of the things, one of the, the recurring themes that's come up on, on several of the podcasts, not just yours, but others as well that I've listened to, has been the, um, I would say joke, but almost the every space is taken up by white yoga teachers. Mm. And that therefore um, women with darker skin may not feel comfortable going into that space because they're the only person with their shaped body and they're the only person who's not coming with their, you know, sort of driven in their big car to the white space, yoga space, really mm. stereotypical. And so talking about exercise and how to signpost people to exercise that they can do, there are a lot of really fantastic places to go for exercise that are not white. But for me to point that out in a talk, and say, but you know, follow this lady or listen to Anita Powell, you know, at number three, it's all about exercise. Or I think it's number three is, or, you know, or another host talking, getting a, getting a yoga coach in who took up yoga because she didn't want to go to a white yoga teacher. So she became a yoga coach so that she could be a, um, I think she's Caribbean heritage yoga teacher within her own community that was relevant to everybody she lives nearby. Not everybody, yeah. but, you know, her story is fascinating and she's filling a gap, but she's just one, one, one of many but one person in her community who is not a white yoga teacher she is a yoga teacher from the Caribbean so she runs classes aimed at her social I don't know how to sign her post that sort of information and talk again without being really specific you know it's it's really important that people listen to me if they they look at me and go right you know white woman talking about going to yoga I'm zoning out here I want to be able to go don't zone out but find somewhere that's relevant to you to go that you're comfortable in that you enjoy going uh, my response is based on my, um, I, some people might disagree with me. If you sometimes fear that you will get backlash and this kid, the backlash might not be black or Asian backlash. It might be white backlash. The fact you're identifying and think it's not important. Why are you being racist by causing a division? We shouldn't, we shouldn't do a division. We should just do all, everything white because they don't really understand. That's what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, sometimes what I would then do is I would I would create a space where you kind of highlight that um, different communities want representation in an activity because it is it's an important part. It's about representation. So I would say and then to 
make it possibly a less of a race race issue i would incorporate other things into it so i'm a plus size woman i know there's a plus size body positive space out there so it could be actually listed not just ethnicity so you could say um if um so you have a disclaimer you understand there's differences you want representation and here if you want to engage with people who experience who who talk about the topic of fitness but also they're from different cultural backgrounds or whatever or different backgrounds here is blah 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 and list them and do body positive um black um gay trans you know um you know trans and you list the different groups then i would imagine some people will moan but you're not picking out just race and you're also understanding about the representation issue being a barrier because you put that disclaimer there that says you understand that some people want to engage. And also, like some say, for instance, Muslim women want to exercise, but they think it's inappropriate that the exercise teacher is half naked and their husbands wouldn't want them to watch a half naked woman exercise because they don't think it's appropriate dress. So go into a fitness trainer who dresses culturally while doing the same exercise is more acceptable to them and to their family who might be in the room watching them. You know, things like that you have to think about, but also explain their disclaimer to people who might see it as inappropriate, you highlight indifference. Yeah. Does that help? But it really does. But going back to um, what, how, how do I keep learning from others? This is the input that this, I mean, I know it's a podcast, so it's not a silent space, but, but a safe space to be able to ask questions that might be coming from a place of ignorance but it's not wanting to stay ignorant and some of my questions might be offensive but without understanding why or being told not to ask it that way or to ask it this way I'm scared to ask it at all yeah. so so having the input from from you today for example in some of our other other conversations and listening to pod, your podcast and, and others that's about me learning how to get it right how to prove my own personal signposting without causing offense that that I'm scared of mentioning sometimes in case I cause offence. And that's, you know, as you said, make it more general body, body positive, you know, bring in the gay, bring, bring in um, colour, bring in um, religion into that picture, makes it all about representation rather than not mentioning this at all. But I don't want to alienate people to, to what I'm trying to say as a general message because they've signed out of my space. Yes. You know, and I've, I've heard from so many people on different podcasts going, you know, it's all very well being told to go to a yoga class full of, you know, middle class white women, all all size 10, who swan in and they're not going to work. It's a totally different picture if you're a single mum, don't have the money for the yoga, and you work a 12 hour shift on your feet. Me telling them to go to yoga is not the right advice. And, they're not going to listen to that. And one of the reasons why I don't listen, it's also an important thing as well, it's sometimes you get, you, you, people treat you badly. I mean, I, as I've mentioned, I'm a plus size woman. I once went to um i'm actually well i'm not so flexible now but a few years ago i was extremely flexible still a larger woman but i could i could if you said do the splits i could do the splits immediately no warm-up and whatever so i'm very naturally flexible even wow. though I, I can't do it now so i used to go to um a yoga class which were full of white middle class very slim women and the room was, was very packed because it's a very popular class and i remember once the woman behind me who's very, very middle class by her accent and white and whatever. I heard her say, I can't see anything. There's a wall in front of me. <laughs> and that's one of the things that contribute to different communities not going to spaces. That wasn't a microaggression. That was a direct aggression. I could hear that it. Was, there was nothing micro about that. <laughs> there was nothing micro. Not, I wasn't talking about you being wall. I was talking about the size of the aggression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I was thinking and I looked around for where is this wall and it clearly you know and and this is also when we talk about safe spaces so I stopped going to that class um and I would say I'm quite confident as a person I thought you know what I don't need to put up with because she vocalized probably what a lot of people subconsciously are thinking and I don't yeah. need to pay to go into a space where I've been judged no, you know, no. And the thing is, but, I was more flexible than her. This wall can bend. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was maybe it was you on your podcast telling telling something about that that made me realise that not everybody wants to go to the same yoga class for a, but a whole host of reasons. Whether it's time of day or whether it's 
not fitting into the room or feeling like you're the only person in the room that looks like you. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes, a whole load of reasons, yeah. And sometimes it's not internal, it's sometimes it's being put upon you. So I had no problems with that yoga class till I heard that woman. Yeah, because if I could hear, others could hear it. I had no problems with it, um, that yoga class. So it wasn't about me feeling uncomfortable walking into that class because I was actually more flexible than most women in that class. But she made me conscious of my difference. And she vocalized what other people probably are thinking. And it made me realize I'm not going to pay to be judged. No, <laughs> it's yeah, quite a, quite a, um, what's it, a lot of audacity behind that comment anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's um shame it wasn't the right space to turn to turn around. What's that move you do when you put your leg up the back and kick someone? What's that move? <laughs> yeah, but I'm not allowed because the black woman we're perceived to be aggressive. So therefore, it's like even though you've been really rude to me, I have to just walk away and do nothing. And 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 yeah. this is also the contribution. Sometimes when people of color lash out, it's because there's a, cu- a cumulative um, response over loads of aggressions and, ni- and microaggressions that you've received because I was born this colour. It's something, I'm 50 now. I've had 50 years of aggression. <laughs> yeah, I'm half yeah. a century, as my son reminds me. So if you think about how many times you, I've walked away from microaggressions or aggressions and said nothing, and then sometimes somebody says something and you respond, and even though your response is valid, because, you ha- because you're tainted with that, that brush of being aggressive, it's amplified in other voices voices and then people think, you see you see you see what they're like those people that's what they're like and then it's amplified you know and you're branded then but that's that's um i think i could ask you so many questions back to back to finding out where i can learn from direct conversation is easiest to be able to yeah. ask questions that i'm scared of asking for fear of causing inadvertent offense and the onus should be on me to learn and the onus is on me to learn but without a teacher or a guidance or a mentor it's hard to learn it's hard to, i can't google for example origins of the expression strong black woman yeah there are well, i've tried actually there are so many different viewpoints on that that i can't get a of course there are everyone's got a different opinion mm. but i've never heard that expression as a standalone expression as sort of started listening um to podcasts hosted by by women of different cultural heritage, different skin colour. And the, that theme, the strong black woman theme, comes or expression comes up again and again and again. It's something I've never, I must have heard it, but I've never taken it out as meaning to anything different to being a strong woman. Yeah, it's a negative thing when you're a black woman, but as a white woman, it's a positive thing. Yeah, and so, yeah. so I didn't, I, I hadn't ever separated the two phrases. Yeah. I w- almost, if I'm honest, I probably thought, why are we bringing colour into the strong woman conversation? Having listened to the podcast, having done some research into it, I now know a bit more about the history of and the implications of being raised to be and being a strong black woman. But a, I'm a strong black alone. woman is reactive to abuse in control. Yeah. Uh, that's and that's doesn't the ever, difference. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's also not, doesn't it's ever not accept help. Yeah. But in terms of self care, in terms of, of how we approach aging and um, yeah. and who's responsible for the world, all of all of that. So even not knowing the nuances of that particular phrase, I've had nobody I can ask without, you know, you said earlier, social interactions are a really good place to start broadening my knowledge, which they absolutely are. But if I met you at a party and I came up and I've got some questions I really, really need to ask, I've immediately fallen into the trap of I've singled you out because of your colour. So I'm, I'm in a funny loop of needing a mental all so I can ask questions that I can't ask so I can learn so I can become bigger and understand more and it goes upwards rather than downwards mm. but it's um which comes back down to you know being a good ally where do you learn from who do you see as a role model how can you know that whole space is what well, it's new and also there's a, another element of allyship which which I can understand the obstacles you might experience based on your background the lack of diverseness in your social life, um, your, your communities and whatever. But there's another space which is growing with regards to allyship, but it's actually, there's, an, there's a strong negative element where allies are adopting more maternal roles which are inappropriate. So they're becoming white saviors. So sometimes they, they, they turn around and they say to somebody like me, you need to be quiet, I'm here to represent you. And they give a narrative <laughs> which they interpret as they interpret based on their understanding and it's not always accurate. And I've, I've experienced this at work. I remember once I was working on a project and I was, and 
it was just after COVID, so it was quite recent, a few years ago, and I was working with some young people, and there was this young uh, black boy who was struggling with mental health after COVID. And I said to him, I can arrange for a counsellor to see him. Yeah. And I said to him, do you have a preference? So do you want to see any counsellor? Do you want to see a male counsellor? Do you want to see a male counsellor, a counsellor who is black? Because he was black. And he said to me, oh, um, a black male counsellor, please. Yeah. Now, the white female who I worked with, who was my boss, said, what's the difference between the white counsel, the black counsellor and the Asian counsellor and the white counsellor? I'll just get him a counsellor we use. And I just thought, you just heard him say his preference. You have set up a project to target diverse communities. So she had set it up. So she's considered to be an ally. And she has then ignored what I, as a black woman, have said, nor what the client, as a black young man, has said. And she's then decided there's no difference, she'll get someone. So she actually is a, a white savior. And in that scenario, she was dangerous because she was ignoring the needs of that man, even though he said it to her face, he, she dismissed it. I haven't heard the expression white savior before. Do you mean by that somebody who speaks for you, but doesn't hear you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, it, it relates, I mean, what's, yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, we often, when you think about, well, this is what I think about, because I'm not an expert on the topic. Um, in olden days, when you used to find missionaries um, who, you know, and, and take foreigners or what they considered to be foreigners and civilize them. So they taught them religion, changed their clothes, taught them how to read and write. Where, and it was a very patronizing, condescending element to them. So even though they worked towards improving the quality of their lives, they also still, pigeonholed them as being dumb um, and they restricted their development so they only taught them what they need to know to be at a certain level they never taught them what they need to know to be the best that they can be so none of them were ever going to be equivalent to their equal even though they might have had the capacity so saviors can be quite dangerous in the fact that they do that they, for instance this woman my boss she organized a project to help diverse kids um and it was and, and one of the topics that we covered was mental health after covid but then she ignored that really important part where a black boy told me he wanted to see a black man to talk about his mental health and she ignored that while he was in front of her and in front of me she ignored it and was telling me what she's going to do that's, that's just another one of those areas where that line between getting it right and getting it wrong yeah is slightly blurred different perspectives have different viewpoints on the same line and yeah. and getting it wrong wasn't intentional though which which is a repeat theme on 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 learning around different cultures different you know different impacts of diversity in our lives yeah. it's that that line is is it's moving it's a different place for each person and and the different responses really affect how we're seen how we're heard what we hear and how we say it and it's yeah. it's a it's a very tricky area to navigate yeah i mean and also this particular woman even though she, her heart i think was in the right place i think that her skill set wasn't up to it but i know after the george floyd thing she went where she was asked by loads of organizations in the town that i live in to do talks on diversity yeah, and, I, and I'm thinking, why did you ask her? She's not the person I would go to. All because she empathises. It doesn't mean that she's the best person to talk about. Um, but they felt comfortable because she was white. They felt she was white. She understood allyship. That's what, and therefore she was asked to go around. I've worked with her. There's loads of gaps in her knowledge. And some of her delivery um, is condescending and patronising with regards to diverseness. So I personally would never recommend her to do a talk on allyship, but loads of organisations in the town that I live with, after George Floyd, employed her to go around and talk about um, racism and um, allyship and how to be a good ally. Yeah, that's, that's another big question then. The U.S. Border Patrol has exciting and rewarding career opportunities with the nation's largest law enforcement organization. Earn great pay with outstanding federal benefits and up to $20,000 in recruitment incentives. Learn more online at cbp.gov careers usbp.